talked about all four main areas of temperament for this course, and it's important to be able to contrast across them. So although the Rothbart looked at more biological reactivity, Buss and Plowman looked at genes, and Goldsmith looked at brain physiology, and then we had the Thompson Chest look at more environment and goodness of fit, we can see lots of overlay in terms of their dimensions of temperament. That is, Rothbard's theory of surgency definitely overlaps with Chess and Thomas's ideas of activity and approach, which overlaps with activity and sociability by Buss and Plowman. We can see here with negative affectivity, we can see how this would overlap with domains of sensitivity, affect, reactivity or intensity, adaptability uh, with Chess and Thomas. We can also see that overlap with emotionality in the other two theories of Buss and Plowman and Goldsmith. And finally, with Everfull Control, we can see how that would overlap with Distractibility and Persistence by Thomas and Chess, but also with Buss and Plowman's Inverse Impulsivity. The only one that sort of stands out here is Rhythmicity, and so this is the idea, it doesn't quite fit, it could perhaps go with negative affectivity, but not quite, and it seems to be on its own, its own thing. So regardless of which four of these uh, areas of temperament we're looking at, we tend to find there's a lot of overlap in how we measure temperament. Uh, and that is the idea when we actually want to measure temperament in infants and in children, uh, the bulk of the research tends to rely on parent rated measures or teacher rated measures. And so this is the idea, you give parents a survey asking about the emotionality or the activity or the surgency or the sensitivity of their children. Now, when it comes to parent rated measures, uh, there is some pros to this. They're very inexpensive. We can get lots more kids in our sample. But parents are pretty biased. They may overemphasize some problem behaviors in their kids to get attention, or they may underemphasize to make their kids seem perfect. They also might be trying to be honest, but they just know less kids. They aren't following their kids to the classroom, or if they're a new parent rating their baby, they may not have exposure to lots of other babies. Teachers will have exposure to more kids and are considered to be somewhat less biased than parents, but they still only see the child in one context and as often those quiet children tend to get underrated in certain things because teachers don't know if the quiet kids are just calm and quiet or if they're really tense and quiet in a lot of situations. So some researchers really vouch for the observation approach, that we should take kids into a lab and either just observe them in free play or actually get them to do tasks to get proxies for their temperament. And this is really cool because we can test them and see them, and it's a new context for all the kids, so we can judge them pretty equally. However, we tend to find that some kids are more exposed to research than others. We also tend to find, however, this is a really expensive way to collect data. You can only get so many kids at once. Not all families can make it to the lab. We tend to get a more biased sample of kids that will come to the lab. They tend to be a kids of parents who are more highly educated or who can take time off to take them to the university laboratories. And so it does also bias the research. There's no right or wrong way, but a lot of research will say that observations are the gold standard, especially if you can do naturalistic observations on a playground or in a school setting by a third party that's not a teacher or a parent. Those tend to be the gold standard. Now, when we think about measuring temperament, it's important to understand, do we expect these measurements to be stable? Now we know that temperament is pretty heterotypic. Uh, and so it's important to understand that some indices like uh, Thomas and Chess um, dimension of reactivity is considered to change over time. We consider kids to have a less intense reaction as they get older. That is, two-year-olds will have a more stronger and more intense display of anger and frustration than a five-year-old than a 10-year-old. We also find that attention changes as we mature, attention grows and changes quite widely. So we wouldn't expect that to be very stable. We'd expect that to have to have age norms. We also know that other indices such as inhibitory control, other forms of emotionality, um, such as Goldsmith's version of emotionality and uh, Buss and Plowman's tends to be more stable. We also find that effortful control can be more stable based on how Rothbard defined it and activity tends to be more stable but it's important to understand that the, this stability can still look like change in some ways. And that's because even when the trait is somewhat stable, we have to think about measuring it in a slightly different way as we get older. If you think about activity, how we'd measure activity in an infant versus how we'd measure activity in a five-year-old, uh, they're gonna look very different. So activity in infant might be how often do they kick, do they stand up in their crib, do they bounce around in their jolly jumper, versus a five-year-old is saying, you know, how many hours a week are they in sports? Uh, so it's going to be a very different measure. 
If we think about things like effortful control, is that putting together a puzzle or is that reading a book? The idea that what we have to ask on our surveys has to change and be age appropriate is the concept of coherence. This is the idea that the questions we ask for a survey about three-year-olds versus eight-year-olds has to be reflective of what's going on with them and what's developmentally appropriate for that age group. Now, if we measure it right, we might see this fascinating phenomenon known as rank order stability. And this is the idea that a child with less effortful control might start to display more effortful control, but they're still showing less compared to their same age peers. They were below average before and they're still below average now. And we might see a child who's above average before is still above average now on a different trait. So although their absolute level of the temperament changes, it relative to their same age peers, they sort of stay behind the same. Are they still behind the pack or below the pack? Now, in terms of stability of temperament, we know that if you measure right away in newborns or measure in four month olds, it's not the most stable thing. It does offer some prediction, but it's not great. But if you measure in the second year of life, that is from the first birthday on, we tend to find the temperament is very highly stable. So there's some fluctuations that can happen in the first year of life, but once they hit one year of age, this can be pretty predictive of who they'll be when they're four and when they're six and when they're eight. So now that we've talked about measuring a temperament and how stable temperament is, we know it's somewhat stable. We know it's pretty easy to measure. So what do we find in the temperament research? Well, I could be here for weeks and weeks, but I'm going to summarize this pretty quickly. It's, it's, it's pretty succinct. Uh, rather than going into lots of different studies that basically say the same thing, we have a huge body of literature now that find there are lots of outcomes associated with temperaments. We can measure someone's temperament very early on in their preschool years, and this can predict what they'll be like in, in middle elementary. It can predict who's going to have emotional problems. That is, we tend to find infants with more emotionality and more negative affectivity. They tend to have more emotional problems, such as higher levels of anxiety and higher levels of depression. We also find that early preschool temperament can predict later childhood conduct problems. That is a child who's high insurgency or a child who's low in attention. They might be more often getting out of their seat at school or they might be more aggressive at school. Um, we, can, we can see that pretty early on. We also find that early temperaments tied with peer acceptance or peer rejection. Those kids that are more social, but also more adaptive and less sensitive, they tend to thrive more in social spaces later on versus the kids that are going to be more withdrawn and less approachable, they tend to not be accepted by their peers as readily. And finally, we can see how effortful control early on in our toddler years can be applied and connected to our academic achievement or academic engagement later on. And so there's lots of outcomes. We can go in to talk about sibling relationships, teacher-child relationships, nearly anything has shown a connection with our temperament. But a key thing I wanna point out here is it's not always a one-to-one. -one. We find that yes, these temperamental traits in MC do tend to be tied to these outcomes, but it's not a jail sentence. There's lots of things that can happen that can moderate this. So let's talk about the moderators. A moderator is the idea that you might be on this train track. If you're high in emotionality, you might be on this train track leading to anxiety town. But there could be things that happen in your environment or in your experiences that make you change the train track that you're on. And that's a moderator. And we tend to find there's moderators at the child level, at the family level, and at the larger contextual level. One of the main child factors we tend to investigate is gender. This is the idea that boys who are high in activity versus girls that are high in activity may have different outcomes. Boys may be rewarded for being high in activity versus girls may be criticized. We also might find that girls that are low in approach and more shy are more rewarded or protected versus boys who are high in shyness or low in approach, they may be more criticized. So gender can definitely be a large moderator. We also find that parents' personality and parents' behaviors can be a moderator. As mentioned with the gene environment interaction, uh, if a parent's uh, personality matches a child's temperament, there might be a better fit versus if a parent is different than a child, there might be more clashes and it might exacerbate problems. Regardless of a parent's personality, if the parent is sensitive and responsive to the child's temperament, we may see that ameliorate or buffer against problems. We also know that family mental health plays a role. So if the parents are experiencing depression or anxiety themselves, that can also exacerbate the conduct problems or emotional problems in kids.
and we also know that the number of caregivers in a home and if there's conflict in the home relating to marital status or divorce or single parenthood that can also play a huge factor in how kids thrive especially if they're under if they're experiencing a divorce in the early childhood years in early elementary years that can definitely change the association between their temperament and outcomes and finally, I just want to talk broadly about contextual factors. There's so many contextual factors we can talk about. Uh, there's historical events that kids undergo, such as the COVID-19 crisis. That's going to have a huge impact on everyone's developmental outcomes. Um, so history, geography, uh, what time and place you're living in, how your social group is perceived by other social groups in terms of your cultural, ethnic, religious group, and particularly your socioeconomic status. We know that family income can play a large role in influencing the links between temperament and outcomes. And that is families that are struggling to put food on the table, struggling to pay bills, families that are experiencing a lot of unemployment, that's going to exacerbate any of the risks a temperament has to certain outcomes. Versus a family that has a comfortable financial situation and they can buy tutors and they get intervention, they can provide their child with counseling or play groups or all these extracurriculars, that's going to buffer the child drastically. So this is a large impact for sure. So now we've talked a lot about temperament. Uh, we can make this whole course about temperament, diving into the specific outcomes of temperament, when and where, but I just wanted to keep it at a glazing surface for this point. Uh, and so it's important to understand, although we know a lot about temperament, there's still a lot of questions that remain. One of the most complex questions is whether temperament uh, should be examined in a person-centered or dimension-centered way. So a person-centered way is if we were to calculate everyone's temperament scores and cluster them into types, much like the Thomas and Chess approach, that cluster them into resilient, under-controlled, and over-controlled types. Is that the best way about going it? Should we take someone's constellation of scores and say you are high in effortful control, low in activity, high in this, and say you're this type of person? And should we say, you know, these types of kids versus these types of kids do differently? Most of the research on temperament hasn't done this. Most of the research on temperament has actually taken a dimension approach. And rather than looking at different types of kids, they look at the associations of what low effortful control does, a correlation with outcomes, and what activity does, a correlation with outcomes, and what, um, let, let's say, negative affectivity does, and a correlation of outcomes. And they look at it through that lens, they, rather than taking a person-centered approach. And the reason for this has to do with our assumptions around the independence of our temperament dimensions. And so this is the idea uh, that if we believe our temperament dimensions are completely independent or orthogonal, then we can look at these different combinations. We can get these different combinations, say you're high on this, low on this, high on this, you're this type. Uh, but there's lots of evidence to suggest perhaps temperament dimensions are non-orthogonal or non-independent. That is, perhaps kids with a higher activity may be somewhere on the effortful control. If we were to assume that all kids high in activity are low in effortful control, or all kids high in effortful control are low in activity, then that would be non-orthogonal or non-independent. And so that, that would drastically uh, influence if we would take an orthogonal or non-orthogonal approach, or a person-centered versus dimensional approach. Finally, it's important to understand, we now know that stability in temperament is heterotypic. So why is it heterotypic? Uh, why are some kids more likely to change their temperament versus others stay more constant? And why are some traits more changeable versus not other traits? And are there some contexts where temperament matters more? Is it, does it matter if someone has a constant temperament across contexts? Or does it matter if they change temperament across contexts? You may know a person who's very out of the box in some situations and very withdrawn in other situations. Does that mean they're gonna have different outcomes than someone who's more stable across contexts? And finally, can we influence temperament? Can we change temperament intentionally? Particularly with the dimensions of temperament associated with cognitive executive function. Can we influence effortful control? Can we influence emotional regulation? These are the questions we need to answer in the future of temperamental research. Thanks for listening. You've now reached the end of Unit 1, Temperament for Social Personality Development.